the House Republican Policy Committee will come to order. The committee is meeting today to examine testimony regarding, the hi regarding hydropower and the workforce. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. I want to thank everyone for being here today as we host our fifth Millennial Task Force hearing to focus on the unique challenges and opportunities millennials face in the hydropower industry. Millennials are the largest, most educated, and most diverse generation in American history, and because of that, millennials are shaping the future of America's economy. We have learned in previous hearings that millennials are making the American workplace more dynamic, but this is not the only change they are bringing to our economy. Millennials are changing the way Americans consume, and experts have identified four major trends exhibited by consumers. They want products that are relevant to their lifestyle, lifestyle that are immediately accessible, that can be consumed collectively, and most importantly, they want products that align with their moral or political ideals. Most of us have seen this disruption demonstrated with companies such as Uber, Airbnb, and Amazon, but millennials are pulling energy consumption into this conversation. Over 80% of millennials would like to have in-home digital assistance and monitoring of energy consumption, and there are increased demands on utility providers to provide more renewable energy. The American energy sector is an exciting place, is in an exciting place. Just last year, renewable energy reached its highest ever production levels with hydropower, accounting for 25% of this, more than solar and wind combined. What makes these totals even more promising is the potential for massive growth within the hydropower sector. To make this expansion a reality, the hydropower industry needs a robust workforce. In fact, some reports indicate there could be over one million jobs in the hydropower sector if the industry meets its domestic potential. These jobs range from postgraduate professionals, such as attorneys, managers, and engineers, to skilled and unskilled craftsmen and clerical workers. High school graduates and those with PhDs can find employment in the hydropower industry in almost every state across the country. Unfortunately, the hydropower industry is facing an aging workforce and has not been able to attract as many millennials as solar and wind sectors have. As we have heard from previous witnesses, a large concern for many employers is this loss of human experience that comes when an employee retires without having been able to impart this knowledge on a new incoming worker. We must act to prevent stagnation in a critical co component of our renewable energy portfolio and while there's no cure-all solution, we do know that policies and programs that encourage job-ready training and education will greatly assist more millennials to find work in the renewable energy industry. Today we have three witnesses who will discuss the challenges and opportunities in the hydropower workforce and their professional experiences. I look forward to hearing from them and discussing ways we can further assist in growing this essential workforce. For those of you in the audience or watching online, you may have questions for our witnesses, and you can tweet your question using the hashtag, hashtag GOP Future, and we may ask your question time permitting. We are fortunate to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today. I'll start with, at my left, Mr. Charles Hernick is the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions in Washington, D.C. Charles was brought on to lead CRES's forum policy work and execute strategies to advance clean energy solutions and innovative approaches to reducing carbon emissions. Charles is an energy expert who understands emerging clean technologies, market barriers, and policies and regulation. For over a decade, he has worked at the crossroads of economic development, energy, and national resource management across the U.S. and on the ground in over a dozen countries in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Before joining CRES, he advised executive level decision makers at EPA and USAID on energy and environmental issues and identified project level opportunities for clean energy expansion. Um, Justin Trudell is the director of Brookfield Renewables Northeast Operations, where he oversees the day to day and strategic operation of 46 hydroelectric assets and one wind energy project. Justin has over 10 years of experience in energy generation and management, including his time in the U.S. Navy nuclear program. Justin has been with Brookfield Renewables since 2009, working in various roles and locations. Prior to joining Brookfield Renewable, he spent five years in the U.S. Navy as a commissioned officer. His first tour was aboard the USS Oscar Austin, where he served various roles and deployed to the Persian Gulf. He spent the remainder of his time in the Navy in the nuclear program, ultimately managing a team running and maintaining the reactors aboard the USS Harry S. Truman, 
which I actually have visited before, where he made a second deployment to the Persian Gulf. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Our third witness is Mr. Adam Witt, who is a hydropower systems research engineer at Oak Ridge National Lab, the largest U.S. Department of Energy Science and Energy Laboratory, conducting basic and applied research on compelling problems in energy and security. His research focuses on evaluating, developing, and deploying innovative software and technology to advance environmentally responsible, cost-competitive hydropower generation. In 2006, he received his undergraduate degree in physics from Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, and spent four years working in the insurance industry before starting a graduate program at the University of Minnesota. He received a PhD in civil engineering in 2014 and joined the Energy Water Resource Systems Group at Oak Ridge. In that time, he has worked to improve water quality in the largest hydropower system in the country, optimize hydropower assets in the lower Mekong River of Southeast Asia, advance novel applications of pumped storage hydropower, and facilitate a collaborative effort for innovation in environmental design of small hydropower systems. Adam lives in Knoxville, Tennessee with his wife and two boys. Thank you to each of you for being here today. Uh, I will now recognize Mr. Hernick for his opening statements. Thank you and good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here and talk about the future of hydropower and the millennial workforce. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Charles Hernick and I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum. Uh, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization committed to educating the public and influencing the national conversation about common sense and clean energy. My remarks are informed by years of experience working as a consultant to U.S. Environmental Protection Agency on workforce issues for public utilities, specifically in the water sector, and over a decade working in the energy and environmental sector across the United States and abroad, and as a millennial myself. Uh, when it comes to millennials and hydropower, I'd like you to keep three things in mind. First, hydropower has a long proven track record in the United States. We're building off of a legacy of stable, renewable power. Recent technological innovation makes it one of the most dynamic sources of power today. Second, over the next decade, a generation of workers will retire and require the hydropower sector to fill openings for well-paying, managerial, supervisory, and highly skilled craft worker positions. Millennials will be among the strongest candidates to take these jobs. And finally, it's in our national interest to take advantage of such an abundant domestic natural resource and pair it with a new generation of human capital to build resilient local economies across the United States, especially in rural America. Thoughtful and effective public policy will help. Hydropower is a uniquely American clean energy source. The first hydropower plant opened 135 years ago in a small town in Wisconsin. In the century since, hydropower has become critical to our energy infrastructure. In fact, it provides four states with more than half of their power and another four states with at least a quarter of their power. At the same time, it fulfills essential needs like water management, flow and flood regulation, and land protection for areas that provide important ecosystem services such as recreation and critical habitat. Hydropower covers a, a wide range of technologies. We're very familiar with the iconic conventional hydropower technologies, dams. They store water behind a generating facility and, and harness that power as it runs through the turbines. This type of conventional hydropower project represents the clear majority of U.S. hydropower generation. But the frontier of hydropower looks quite different and leaves behind many of the environmental and social challenges that building dams creates. The future of hydropower includes ocean wave, tidal, and hydrokinetic power. It also includes run-of-the-river approaches that maximize power generation and minimize disruptions to the river that affect local economies and often affect fishery-dependent economies miles away. One of the biggest opportunities from the hydropower industries comes from the hydropower industry's increased focus on projects that maximize the benefits of our existing infrastructure, dams, canals, water systems, even abandoned coal mines. We can add new, more efficient generating equipment to existing facilities and add generating capacity to infrastructure that has none today. Other areas of growth include closed loop pump storage systems, which can help solve the intermittency and pricing problems 
as additional solar and wind technologies are added to the grid. We can do a better job capturing energy and water all around us. These new technologies are the answer that we've been looking for. A key step in assuring that what we have in natural resources is matched with human capital, ingenuity, and the enthusiasm of a new generation of workers. The hydropower sector is about to turn over. Workers in the hydropower sector are older than the U.S. average, concentrated between the ages of 46 and 55, with large numbers planning to retire by 2030. Fortunately, hydropower jobs are good jobs. The sector will need millennial, the millennial workforce to take well-paying managerial, supervisory, and highly skilled craft worker and technical positions. The right people for these jobs won't be ready overnight. It will take education and training to position millennials to research new technologies. It will take a new generation of engineers of all types, geologists, hydrologists, biologists, ecologists, to design systems that maximize power and minimize negative impacts. It will take construction workers, managers, and skilled operators. This is an exciting field because it requires expertise from so many professions. These jobs are well distributed across the country, too. Much of our existing dams are in rural America. And with emerging technologies, those canals, drinking water systems, wastewater systems, and waterfronts, urban infrastructure in need of repair and replacement can be retrofitted. Across America, the right minds must be put to the test of drawing out more power from the sleeping assets that we already have. I'm confident that millennials are up to the challenge. But it's also up to the men and women in the industry and our leaders, including our elected officials like yourself, to help articulate and build awareness of the opportunity at hand. Energy policy that truly supports an all of the above approach ensures that a level playing field is available. As part of that policy, Congress should provide funding for critical programs that will make the future of hydropower cleaner. It's worth investing in and making the newest environmentally and fish fresh friendly technologies actually operational. We also need infrastructure policy that looks at revitalizing old assets as an opportunity for public-private partnerships and multiple uses that include energy generation. We also need to encourage innovation, options, and competition in the education system that will ensure that students can get a job after high school, pursue a trade or technical degree that will align with these highly skilled craft worker positions in hydropower, or pursue higher education for engineering and managerial positions. We need to start now by working with colleges and educational institutions so that the workforce is skilled and in time for the turnover of the old guard. Capitalizing on these opportunities will assure that we capture the economic and social benefits of both existing and potential new hydropower. Entire communities supported by hydropower generation and economic development are not a thing of the past. Done right, it can help preserve the character of our communities, especially those in rural America. Hydropower can support long-lasting careers that keep families together, boost local small businesses, stimulate overall economic growth, and generate tax revenue for key services such as first responders, libraries, parks, and yield less in air water pollution compared to other sources of energy production and avoid greenhouse gas emissions. It's my hope that Congress will make opportunities for millennials in the hydropower sector a top priority over the next few years. Hydropower is an American comparative advantage. Let's keep it that way. Thank you for your time and consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hernick. I now recognize Mr. Trudell for his opening statement. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you for providing Brookfield Renewable an opportunity to discuss millennials in the hydro workforce. My name is Justin Trudell, I'm Director of Operations for Brookfield. I've been with the company a little over eight years in various roles, from our control center in Marlboro, Massachusetts, out to our West Coast operating region in Los Angeles, and now I'm in our uh, Northeast region in Mass. New Hampshire and Maine. Before joining Brookfield, I served five years in the Navy, and I am also a millennial, albeit on the cusp. <laughs> Brookfield is one of the largest publicly traded pure play renewable energy providers in the world. We have over 100 years of experience in power generation with full operations, development, and power marketing capabilities. Worldwide, the company has $26 billion of assets under management with over 10,600 megawatts of installed capacity. 
88% of our power generation comes from hydroelectric generators situated on 82 rivers. In the U.S., we operate 137 stations and seven wind farms capable of providing for the energy needs of approximately 1.3 million homes. And in your district, we operate 55 hydro facilities with 136 local employees, roughly 30 of whom are millennials. Across North America, Brookfield Renewable employs 1,100 people. In preparation for this meeting, we performed a review of our employee database and found that roughly 54% of our full-time workforce belongs to the millennial generation. According to several internet sources, sometime around 2016, millennials surpassed Gen X and baby boomers to become the largest cohort in the North American workforce, something you alluded to earlier, making up somewhere around 36%. This would suggest that Brookfield Renewable is ahead of the curve. Looking at the data a bit further, however, I wasn't surprised to find disparities across our various job classifications. Most of our Brookfield millennials are working in the support services groups, HR, finance, energy marketing and trading, legal and community relations. Millennials only make up 23% of our operations employees. And even in our operations group, we tend to find our millennials working in environmental and regulatory compliance, project management, or as remote operators, working at computer stations and controlling our assets from Marlboro, Massachusetts and Gatineau, Quebec. The percentage of millennials in our more blue-collar jobs, such as mechanical maintenance technicians and electricians, is well below 23%. Many of my crews are without a single millennial. In other words, there appears to be a real gap when it comes to the average portion of millennials in the overall workforce compared with those in the skilled trades or other blue collar jobs. One of the things we do at Brookfield Renewable to address this gap in millennials in our technical skills trades is to use internships to introduce college students to the hydro industry. We also attend college and university career days in the communities where we have assets and we host school field trips to our facilities. These efforts are aimed at keeping hydropower in the forefront of soon-to-be college grads, as well as the next generation of the workforce. Unfortunately, hydro is too often seen as an old technology that doesn't get its fair share of the clean power spotlight. We have several assets, for example, that have been generating clean, renewable energy for over 100 years. And across the U.S., hydro has been part of the energy mix of most states for many decades, making up some portion of their baseload power. And although I don't have statistics for millennials working in solar and wind, Hydro's relatively low profile and comparative lack of media attention may account for a lack of younger workers occupying our blue collar jobs. Interestingly, however, hydropower's importance to the electric grid is increasing as it rapidly evolves and decarbonizes. Hydropower enables the increasing penetration of intermittent renewables by balancing these resources with clean renewable electricity rather than relying on the so-called brown grid. Hydropower also provides robust energy storage capabilities and flexibility that enhances grid reliability and resilience, maximizing benefits to consumers. All of this happens without visibility or fanfare, and as a result, many millennials may not recognize the importance of hydropower as a baseload, flexible, and non-emitting resource that is actively enabling the grid of the future. As the U.S. increasingly shifts to a renewable energy future that millennials in particular are demanding, Brookfield will continue to partner with government representatives at the state, local, and federal levels to underscore the importance of hydropower. These efforts will help ensure that hydropower is not only valued for its many environmental and reliability attributes, but is also seen by millennials as an integral part of the country's rapidly decarbonizing electricity supply. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you. I now recognize uh, Dr. Witt for his opening statement. Good afternoon, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to reflect on my experience in the hydropower industry. Uh, I'd especially like to thank you, Representative Stefanik, for convening this dialogue on issues that matter to millennials. My name is Adam Witt, and I'm a hydropower research engineer at Oak Ridge National Lab. I'd like to describe my path into the industry, and then focus on two areas that motivate me as a millennial. Support for education and mentorship, and creating an environment for scientific and technological innovation. I should begin by verifying my millennial credentials. While I was surprised to hear, I technically fit the criteria for the label. My post-college life and career path in many ways typifies the millennial stereotype. I've moved 10 times in 10 years since graduating college and recently bought my first house at age 32. I got married at 29, I had my first kid at 31, 
I'm still repaying undergraduate student loans, it will be for many years. I read the morning news on my phone, I listen to podcasts, and I send videos of my kids to my friends and family on Snapchat. <laughs> and I left a welcoming job in my mid-twenties to get a graduate degree in something I was passionate about. So, pretty, pretty millennial there, I guess. The last point is what eventually led me to hydropower, but it took a while. Like many young people with a fresh college diploma, I didn't know what to do with my life. I graduated with a degree in physics, but the thought of pursuing the field further didn't interest me. I was drawn to business jobs that required a healthy mix of analytical and people skills. The need to start making large student loan payments weighed on me, and I wanted to make good money with strong prospects for making more. So a week after graduation, I started a career as an underwriter for an insurance company. After a year, I transferred to San Francisco and doubled down on a job in corporate America. While I loved every minute of living in the Bay Area and was generally satisfied with my job, I felt myself drifting further from the career in science and engineering I had dreamed about. I spent months contemplating the type of career that would be most fulfilling to me and settled broadly on water and renewable energy, two complex topics that were sure to be relevant throughout my life. After four years in insurance, I took the plunge and applied to graduate school for water resources engineering. I was accepted to the University of Minnesota and began conversations with my advisor. He mentioned the Department of Energy had recently developed graduate fellowships for those interested in studying hydropower. The fellowship would support three years of graduate tuition while providing a living stipend and a health care allowance. As a graduate student, securing a firm funding commitment is a huge advantage and stress reliever, ensuring you can spend time focused on research rather than proposal writing. I jumped at the opportunity to study water and energy, applied, and was awarded a fellowship. After four years of grad school, I received a PhD in civil engineering, and then doubled down on a career in hydro by accepting a job at Oak Ridge. My roundabout entry into the hydropower workforce was not by design. I'm here as a direct result of federal funding that supported my pursuit of higher education. The fellowship gave me the confidence to make a career change, the opportunity to learn and grow my understanding of water issues and renewable energy, and the financial security to take a risk, leave an excellent job, and invest in myself. As evidenced by my own personal journey, Continued support for this type of educational funding is critical to attract millennials into hydropower. Many young people in the industry find hydropower by chance because they weren't aware of career opportunities or were never exposed to hydropower growing up. To me, this reflects two factors. One, hydropower experienced periods of large growth in the past compared to alternative forms of renewable energy that are now growing quickly. So the industry has a dedicated but aging workforce with few young people. And two, as Justin alluded to, hydropower is safe and reliable. The hydropower plants are found in 48 states. If you don't live by one, you likely don't hear much about them. Dr. Witt, can you pause for one second? Can you guys make sure your mics are off? They are. Um, maybe, can you share Justin's? Sure. Thank you. Sorry, we'll turn it back on. All right, there how's that? Good. <laughs> <clears throat> so in my opinion, support for education and mentorship is crucial to overcome these barriers and attract new talent into the industry. One nonprofit, the Hydro Research Foundation, has been exceptional in growing the hydropower workforce. The Hydro Research Foundation, or HRF, awards graduate fellowships to students researching anything hydropower, from dam safety, fish passage, and materials engineering, to sediment transport, climate change, and public policy. Full disclosure, HRF managed my graduate fellowship, so I'm admittedly biased but the fact that I'm here today is a testament to their success with Millennials. To supplement educational support, HRF pairs each fellow with an industry mentor who offers career and research guidance. There's often a daunting gap between what is taught in the classroom and what a young Millennial professional needs to know to get things done in industry. HRF helps bridge that gap by facilitating knowledge transfer from industry leaders to the next generation of hydro subject matter experts, professors, utility executives, and policymakers. I believe another immediate opportunity to grow the hydropower workforce is to offer educational support to millennial veterans transitioning to civ civilian life. Veterans understand team dynamics and are civic minded. Many have a high technical aptitude with mechanical, electrical, and maintenance experience, and most are doers with tremendous discipline. Their uncommon attributes would translate extremely well to hydropower. Much of our largest and oldest river infrastructure was constructed to enhance the US World War II effort Dams and reservoirs are critical infrastructure and energy sectors central to the economy and our national defense. And hydropower turbine generators are some of the largest and complex turbo machines in the world. The promise of a stable and challenging job supporting critical renewable energy infrastructure is a compelling proposition that needs to be made to our veterans in a more coordinated way. 
I believe the federal government has a unique responsibility to support hydropower education and training for two reasons. Most of the hydropower capacity in this country is owned by the American people through federal agencies like the Army Corps of Engineers, the Bureau of Reclamation, and Tennessee Valley Authority. And our shared water resources are a national treasure. A true commitment to renewable electricity from water must be matched with a commitment to educate and mentor the next generation of hydropower stewards. I'd like to finish by talking about innovation and hydropower. I hear the same story from many young millennials looking for work in renewable energy. They're eager to channel their passion to change the world and they don't know where to start. They want to innovate and be creative, but they need to push in the right direction. I see two specific hydropower opportunities that need creative innovation and can capture this energy. Low environmental impact technologies and smart infrastructure. Though hydroelectricity is carbon free and fueled by self replenishing rivers, hydropower facilities have well documented environmental impacts. Many of these are mitigated through structural and operational adjustments. Some are serious and threaten the stability of entire aquatic ecosystems. The industry needs forward-thinking solutions to move towards goal-oriented environmental improvements that also maintain the important energy and multi-purpose benefits of dams and reservoirs. For example, enhanced sediment connectivity and re-establishment of disrupted fish migration corridors would provide benefits that cascade throughout entire watershed systems. Healthy rivers lead to resilient watersheds, clean water attracts outdoor enthusiasts and investment dollars, and abundant stocks of fish and biota are indicators of high-quality river systems. More efficient handling of sediment and fish also ensures turbines are operating as designed with minimal wear and tear. Most existing solutions to these issues reduce the energy output of the plant, generally, generally leading to higher costs and more generation from non-renewable resources. Greater investment in low-impact technologies and solutions to common environmental issues would be a win-win for the industry that would also spark the interest of purpose-driven millennials. Finally, I believe we have a real opportunity to pair infrastructure upgrades with advances in water resource science to catalyze a new wave of innovation in smart hydro systems. The river networks and power systems that surround our dams are evolving. Climate and hydrologic variability are changing the character of entire watersheds, making us rethink how we operate reservoirs. Hydro plants are being called on more and more to balance intermittent generation from a growing fleet of wind and solar resources. Though the hydro industry has a low appetite for risk, a necessary requirement when the safety of life, health, and property is the number one priority. The industry is adept at adopting innovative technologies as they are proven reliable. To foster innovation of reliable solutions, infrastructure invest investments should come hand in hand with a pledge to invest in a full continuum of scientific and engineering understanding. From sensing and monitoring the world around us to innovative design to testing and deployment, we need better information about the surrounding natural environment to ensure dams built 80 years ago will last another 80 years. Investments in data collection, analysis, and scientific interpretation to create robust forecasting and support tools that enable smarter, cost-effective short-term actions and sustainable, more informed long-term decision-making. Design and testing support for pioneering but unproven new structures, generation equipment, and repair methods that must perform well for decades. Development of inventive software, sensors, and analytic tools that use better data to predict failures before they happen. With support for innovation from water to wire, we can spark a renewed creative, creative effort capable of advancing the legacy of hydro as a safe, reliable, renewable energy resource. Technological innovation is unleashed through scientific discovery. This is the message for hydropower that many millennials can and will latch on to. In closing, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on how hydropower can be a compelling industry for millennials. River systems and water, mat water infrastructure matter for everyone, not just millennials. It is our shared responsibility as a nation to protect them for future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all of the opening statements were um, very well put together and right on topic of what I hoped to cover uh, as part of this conversation. Um, both Charles and Justin, you referenced the aging workforce and how that's a challenge uh, when it comes to hydro. Um, I'm particularly interested in what we can do to make sure that we develop a pipeline. And I'll give you an example of an experience I had this past week. I was in uh, my district during our district work period and I visited um, the Institute of Advanced Manufacturing, which is a part of a community college in Plattsburgh in my district. And they have uh, a very effective wind energy program that is a pipeline for wind projects throughout my district and frankly across the country. Um, to my knowledge, they do not have a program specifically focused on hydro. 
what can we do to further encourage um, workforce development and pipelines for those operational jobs that you referenced, Justin, uh, that are currently not being filled by millennials? Uh, why don't I start with Charles, and then I'll go down the line. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. And there's a, to be able to in increase, uh, we're talking about increasing awareness, you know, generally, overall, and, and trying to find opportunities for, for folks who are pursuing technical degrees uh, to be able to move into the, the hydro sector. Um, there needs to be demand for those jobs, and, and part of it can come from uh, an appropriate understanding of what the assets that we have are. I'm a pretty big fan of being able to uh, reinvest in, in our existing infrastructure. It's a priority of the president and the administration uh, to revamp America's infrastructure. And a, a key part of the decision when we're looking at upgrading that infrastructure is whether we want to outsource the technologies or insource. When you look at the 100 years of hydropower that we already have in place, many of that infrastructure was built, those turbines have been, were built by companies that don't exist anymore. Um, to revamp those hydropower systems, you have two options. Either you can take down the whole dam and rebuild the whole thing from scratch, so it's an expensive proposition, and then you may be selecting turbines you can choose to buy American or not. Uh, an option that uh, a company that, that I'm very familiar with, Gravity Hydropower, based out of Boulder, Colorado, they're pursuing an interesting approach, which is they're choosing uh, to uh, rehabilitate existing infrastructure, and one at a time, find the parts that can be uh, replaced by a highly skilled American craftsman and woman. And by choosing that path, they save money in terms of what the overall infrastructure investment is going to cost, and they create demand for jobs that fit the exact mold that, that you're talking about in terms of, of jobs that do require some education, uh, but, but don't require a, a you know, master's degree in engineering or, or whatever. Uh, so there's an opportunity, but it, but it needs to, we need to have it be a matter of, of public priority to look at our existing infrastructure, look at those assets that exist, look at rehabilitating those, those projects, and I think that when you look at uh, a lot of the, the concerns and some of them that Dr. Witt brought up in terms of, of dealing with um, you know, upgrading infrastructure because it is old, if that does create some risk if there is flooding and, and we're looking at dams breaking in California where there's too much water and in other places uh, where that infrastructure needs to be re redesigned, um, it's a great opportunity to focus on how we can increase, how we can rehabilitate and increase energy from these assets that we already have on the ground. Great. Justin, uh, you mentioned how Brookfield, it is a positive story, the fact that 54%, I believe, was the statistic you referenced of your workforce is made of, of millennials. But upon further research, uh, those aren't operational jobs, as you referenced. Um, why has Brookfield been successful broadly at recruiting millennials? You, because that's ahead of the curve for hydro, uh, if you look at it holistically. And then where do you think you can improve in terms of recruiting those operational positions? So I think we, we do have a couple programs targeted at the millennials specifically, uh, but they are more for the, the skilled labor, or excuse me, the, um, the, the management, management side. So we have a program called the Emerging Leaders Program where we, uh, we go find folks that have recently graduated college. We bring them in and we, we give them kind of a well-rounded, um, some well-rounded experience throughout the company, but those folks tend to stick to those support services, like you're saying. So it's difficult to do the same thing with a college graduate for the skilled service, for the skilled job. So you alluded to uh, like local community colleges or, or tech programs, right? Or even at the high school level and getting in with the folks that, um, that may not desire to go to college and, and find a different path in these skilled professions. And as an aside, my wife is in heavy industrial manufacturing, and it's the same story in her industry. I know we're talking about hydro here, but millennials just don't seem to be as drawn to the skill, the skilled labor. So we need to we need to find ways to partner, like you're talking about. One of the things that I think Brookfield agrees wholeheartedly with is getting hydropower in the same breath as wind and solar. When we talk about the renewable energy, and I know that. Um, we've partnered with several programs at all the levels of, of the government to do that. Um, 
but just keeping it relevant in the conversation is helpful. But I think also finding those uh, opportunities locally to partner with the, the tech schools, the vocational schools would be beneficial. Certainly it would be for us. And I uh, think we've talked about it, everyone I think hit on it, is we operate in some rural areas um, where these are some of the best jobs for anybody you know, they, that they can get. We have a, a son who is working at the plant his father built at one of our stations. So it, there, there does tend to be some deep roots there as well, but we can't rely on that to, to fill the next generation. Um, and Adam, you referenced the solar program for veterans, and I believe Solar Ready Vets, and um, that program is operational actually in my district at Fort Drum, but there is not an existing program specifically focused on hydro and encouraging veterans as they leave military service to look at opportunities in the hydro sector. Um, how, uh, first of all, should we be investing in a program like that? And second of all, um, I want to ask you how we should structure that program, and then I'd like to hear from Justin, since you have served uh, in the military, whether you think that would be a useful idea. I can go first. Yes. Um, number one, I think absolutely we should invest in this kind of program. As, as um, my panel members here have alluded to, there's uh, a gap in the workforce, there's an aging workforce, there's a, a knowledge gap, there's a skills gap. Um, that needs to be filled immediately, and um, I think our veterans have a lot of them have a background that will allow them to step into a training program immediately with the kind of hard skills they need and be able to apply those in a hydropower specific context. Um, so the structure of a program like that uh, is, is a little outside of my background as to how that could work, um, but obviously we have a lot of hydro capacity that's owned by um, big federal agencies, a lot of capacity is owned um, also by entities like Brookfield. Um, and so a coordinated effort between these agencies, uh, possibly public-private partnership sort of structure that would uh, invest in a training program for apprenticeships, um, for internships, for different levels of training to help transition people that are coming out of um, of the military into civilian life. I think if you can promise a stable job at a facility that's been around for 80 years and we're making investments to make sure it will be around another 80 years, um, if you can show that hydro it has been a stable part of our energy mix in the United States and it, it continues to be a stable mix, um, hydro is an integrator of these growing solar and wind resources, so it's being used more strategically in areas where other renewables are growing as well. I think if we can message all of those into a training program that will attract people in and then use the training to learn their skills and make them hydro specific. And Justin, I am curious from your perspective, since that you graduated from the Naval Academy, served in the Navy, uh, whether we think developing that pipeline would help fulfill some of the needs of the hydro workforce. Absolutely, and I think um, you know even more, Adam, than than vets being able to step into those training programs. I would contend that. There are a lot of jobs in the military, MOSs and whatnot, in the military that are actually analogous to day one work, right, within the workforce. Um, electricians, maintenance mechanics, turbine techs, they, they all exist already in the military. So it's more about getting that, uh, that frame of mind into the veterans from, from day one, even before they separate, right? So a lot of the TAP classes and some of the other programs that are available for vets as they're leaving active duty is to see if we can get some of these concepts ingrained in those courses so that when a veteran electrician asks, you know, what can I do after I get out? It's not just wind and solar, it's hydro. Um, and we spend a lot of time as well bringing veterans back to the states where they grew up. Not everybody wants to live in the Northeast, um, you know, where, where we have our operations right now. Um, but we have been successful at bringing veterans to the Northeast who had roots there um, previously. So, uh, you know, aside from the training as well, I think it's even even about making it a priority yet at separation or before. All three of you have mentioned the lack of awareness, and we keep millennials here every day about wind and solar and opportunities in those sectors. Um, Adam, you talked about discovering the fellowship program later 
quite late, you know, not when you first started your undergraduate career. It was later on after you had graduated and decided to go back and pursue uh, graduate and a, and a PhD program. Um, would being exposed to the HRF earlier, uh, you think, have made you made that switch to hydro in your career at a younger age? Um, and as a follow-up, uh, how can we further promote that type of mentorship and exposure in higher ed of high hydropower opportunities? Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I think um, it was probably a matter of timing on my part to want to return to graduate school. Um, I think the timing was right when the fellowship came out with HRF. If I would have had, had been exposed to that earlier, um, I'm not sure I would have committed to it, but I, I can say for sure if I was not exposed to it at all, I probably would not have gone into hydrogen. Um, I, was, I was looking to get into renewable energy broadly and, and was passionate about that. And I think it's really important to capture that energy for young people today. I've talked to a lot of undergraduates who are in my position, who are graduating, and they want careers in renewable energy, uh, but they don't know what it looks like. So I think early exposure to these kinds of programs is really beneficial. Um, I think the mentorship aspect of it is huge. If you can see that somebody else is really invested in this, in in this industry, they've made a career out of it, they're very satisfied with what they do, and it's a fulfilling career, I think that's a big motivator for anybody, not just a millennial. Um, but to pair somebody that has a passion for it with somebody who has a lot of energy, I think it creates a really strong relationship. Um, so supporting hydro research programs that have that kind of pairing aspect of it, I think, is really important. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do one question from Twitter. Uh, this is from Matthew Malou. What can college students do on campus to highlight the positive impacts of hydropower in their communities? And I think that's a, I'm just going to add on this, I think it's a valid question because, again, it gets to the awareness issue. Um, I'll start with Charles and then move down the panel. Um, well, I think that the, the thing that we need to realize about hydro is it's all around us. Uh, and so that's where if you're going to school in, a rural, in rural America, uh, if you go out fishing for the weekend or hunting for the weekend, there's a good chance that you're benefiting from some land or water that's protected because of a hydropower project. Uh, and that's, uh, so taking some pictures and sharing them on Twitter would be a, a good thing to do. Um, the other thing uh, that I think we need to do a better job of is for the folks that are in university campuses in big cities. I, I also went to the University of Minnesota uh, in, in Minneapolis. Uh, and so, you know, to, to look nearby, there at the University of Minnesota uh, on the Mississippi River, uh, there are plenty of, of dams and, and lock features. Uh, and understanding how those uh, existing, often overlooked assets uh, have made a meaningful contribution to the local economy and, and still do uh, is, is going to be a critical thing for, for folks to do. So I think uh, look closer to home than, than you expect is, is where to find hydro. Other thoughts, Justin? We own two hydro projects right in downtown Minneapolis and St. Paul. So uh, <laughs> those are ours. Um, the other thing I would say is that there are, um, you know, there are existing programs, right? There are sustainable energy programs and, and uh, degrees already. So I would say get involved in, in those groups as well. Um, and if you're close to the assets, reach out to the owners. We love to give tours safely. Um, you know, but we do love to give tours. There is a lot of recreation, to your point, uh, Charles, a lot of recreation on a lot of our uh, facilities. So, Get the word out, bring your friends out, enjoy the water responsibly. But, um, you know, we, we could also just look at the educational curriculums and I don't know how much oversight the federal government has on, uh, on college curriculum, but um, certainly name recognition and, and just the brand of hydro as well, we, whatever we can do to lift that up a little bit. Adam? So, uh, <clears throat> I studied at San Anthony Falls Laboratory, which took in water from a dam on the Mississippi and then probably sent it through a Brookfield and hydropower facility. And so there's quite a thread going <laughs> through here in Minneapolis. Uh, but one trend that we've noticed is that some colleges are looking at microgrids as a way to generate energy, uh, to get students involved with hands-on experience. 
Um, there's one that's actually going in in the, in the state of New York um, with a small innovative hydropower turbine that we're helping a, a developer develop using advanced manufacturing techniques at Oak Ridge National Lab. So um, just asking the question, what does our electricity mix look like on campus? Where are we getting the electricity? Is there an opportunity to possibly, uh, you know, invest in uh, more local infrastructure, more local energy mix, uh, and see if hydropower can play a role in that mix is one possibility. Um, well, Charles, you talked about truly leveling the playing field for an all of the above energy policy in this country. What are the biggest barriers um, for hydro to be considered on that level playing field compared to wind and solar? Well, I think that uh, when you look at hydro, it's an industry that's that's already standing on its own two feet and doesn't benefit from uh, the extra subsidies that many fossil fuel uh, industries uh, benefit from and solar and wind. Um, so I, I think that the argument is that, that hydropower is ahead of the game when you're looking at a lot of uh, you know the technologies. Um, having said that, there are early technologies uh, that are hydropower and, and you know something like like wave technology is an important one um, where we do need to provide uh, some tax credit or some incentive to to uh, get that fully deployable and there's a reason for that and it's uh, it's not looking for handouts but it's creating it's continuing comparative advantage that I talked about um, when you look at around the world 80% of the new hydro that's going to be coming online. It's going to be coming online not in the U.S. and Europe, but in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia. And I've worked in a lot of these countries. Uh, and we're going to need to compete with folks all around the world when it comes to hydropower, and we're going to want to be able to sell our emerging technologies to those countries. Something like wave technology, uh, well, the oceans are all around us. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity there. And so that if that is a technology that we can master, we can export it. I want to ask further about wave technology and tidal power generation. What regions stand to benefit from uh, those new technologies, and can you specifically sort of look towards what that looks like in the future? Because I think that's helpful uh, for the viewers to hear more specifically about. Sure, I, I might defer to, the, to a, a naval expert uh, in terms of where the where the biggest <laughs> tides are. Um, but I know that there are some early adopters in, in uh, Oregon and Washington. Uh, and right now in Hawaii, actually, Hawaii is making a big push towards solar, but also making a big push in implementing some of the new uh, wave technologies uh, you know, that are out there that are being piloted by the Department of Energy. Justin and Adam, do you want to comment on it? Sure. I'll you. So while Brookfield doesn't tend to be a first mover in new technologies, um, I can certainly speak to the, uh, you know, the benefits of hydropower in the all-in energy grid. Uh, I talked a little bit in my opening remarks about the, you know, the role that hydropower can play in the increasing penetration for intermittent resources like solar and wind. So hydropower could, could be paired very easily and Brookfield is, is trying to do that, to pair it with new build wind and solar and provide a firm price or firm energy bid, right? So that when your wind drops off or at night, um, you can ramp the hydropower up and you can keep a stable energy supply. So um, qualifying hydropower as renewable in, in the grand federal language is helpful. I think there's a federal bill um, that's already uh, up for consideration that changes the definition of renewable to include existing hydro. Um, renewable energy tax credits uh, they're tiered in most places, and existing hydro generally doesn't qualify for the, uh, the more lucrative higher tier subsidies and credits. So um, you know, finding a way to, to level that playing field as well. And, um, Adam spoke about um, you know, the, the fisheries and, and maintaining the aquatic habitat, uh, and, and that's expensive to do. Um, Brookfield recently completed a $14 million fish passage at a 14 megawatt facility on the Kennebec River in Maine. And it's something that, that we're, we're happy to do and proud of, uh, but that type of investment uh, in the assets could be greatly benefited you know, by some, some offset with, with tax credits or, you know, or further qualifying a hydro as 
there's low impact hydro association as well. So there are other programs. Um, but I think we can maybe do a better job at, at highlighting the benefits that existing hydro can still bring to the resource and still the waters, the watershed that uh, they manage. Let me ask you one follow up specific about Brookfield. Um, you mentioned the number of facilities in my district and just broadly the Northeast. Have you um, started partnerships with Canada in terms of the huge hydro resource uh, that we could have economically by partnering with Canada? Um, it's something that I hear about frequently in my district. I did a delegation visit two years ago to Montreal and we visited a Canadian hydro facility and it's just so much untapped potential. Um, has Brookfield invested across the border? Uh, have, they, have you partnered with Canadian hydro companies before? So our corporate headquarters is actually in Gatineau, Quebec. Okay. And, uh, and then even further than that, Brookfield Asset Management, our parent company, is headquartered in Toronto. So we have, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of Canadian assets as well. So when I talk about Brookfield North America, it truly is North America. Um, I think we would tend to view the major players in the Canadian hydro industry as um, competitors, but certainly um, finding ways to increase uh, exposure, and that's something we could all agree on, or um, or finding ways to better allow electricity back and forth across the border is certainly something that, that we could get behind as well. Um, what are the biggest barriers? We talk about modernizing the regulatory process to um, uh, whether it's a hydro facility or various energy products. It's something that we work in my office a lot with uh, local communities, local elected officials when there are red tape barriers that they run into. What are those biggest barriers for hydro, bringing it into the 21st century? Adam, I'll start with you. Um, well, I worked a lot on looking at new small hydro, and so um, one of the things that we're looking at is how do we lower the cost, how do we lower the impacts, um, and how can we increase acceptance of small hydro development generally. Um, and so I think there are uh, a lot of challenges within that. We did a review of the FERC licensing process um, as one of our projects for the Department of Energy and found that uh, successful projects takes about five years to go from when they apply for a preliminary permit until when they receive a license to operate. Um, and that's before they can begin any construction on a project. And so working towards a way to understand what are the energy benefits of a project and what are the environmental benefits and how can we move towards goal-oriented approaches to both of them in a development framework would be helpful um, to help stream, stream on that. In terms of the FERC process, what portion of that process takes the longest time? Did, did your study go into that as well? I mean, where's the biggest lag? Five years is a long time, especially when you're considering uh, millennials who are moving around and within five years. They've already probably changed out jobs twice uh, in that time period. So what specifically uh, is the biggest lag time in the FERC approval process? So there were three steps that we looked at. It was from when you filed a preliminary permit to when you were granted a preliminary permit, um, from when you were granted the permit to when you applied for a license, and then from when you were um, applied for the license to when you were granted a license. And um, for successful projects, it was usually those last two phases. When you're granted a preliminary permit, um, it's relatively straightforward. But the two phases where a lot of time is taken is in uh, preparation of an operational license, original license application, and then in reviewing that license application. So those two steps tend to have um, a lot of back and forth between resource agencies and developers. Um, there's some negotiation going on, there's some necessary studies that go in there, there there's probably some room for improvement and moving towards um, specific criteria and metrics that can be used uh, within that process. Justin, going back to my initial question of this portion, what are the biggest regulatory challenges that Brookfield faces as you're looking to either modernize projects or start new projects? Well, I think we can we can continue talking about the FERC licensing process. Uh, five years is, is our plan as well, uh, even for relicensing existing facilities. Uh, it takes 
it's five years from notice of application to, to final application. And you said studies. Um, we generally spend three years doing various studies. Um, and depends on how many stakeholders there are, how many other interested parties are, are um, involved in that as well. So I'm not, I'm not saying by any means we should, we should cut that out. Um, it's, it's important to understand the impact. The, these licenses are going to last anywhere from 30 to 50 years, depending on you know, how much reinvestment there is in the asset. So quite a bit of negotiations with, with stakeholders and a lot of environmental studies. So maybe I'll find some efficiencies on, on those studies or um, maybe do a little bit more uh, pre-planning and get everybody on the same page in terms of what, uh, what studies are, are going to be proposed and then agreed to. Sometimes what slows us down is we'll agree to a study approach with all the stakeholders, we'll perform the study, we'll provide the results and then somebody wants us to restudy, you know, or study a different way or a different methodology. So I think by getting some clarity early on on exactly what the study plan and program would look to and then stick with it would, would help cut some of that. That's a great suggestion. Charles? I, I think that uh, in, in my mind for permitting is, is the biggest barrier to uh, regulatory barrier to bringing hydropower into the 21st century. Um, so stepping aside from the, the permitting issue, the money is really the, the major thing. I mean, we're, we need uh, Money and demand is what's going to drive projects and what's going to drive interest. Uh, and it's not going to be easy for the hydropower sector because we're in an age where energy prices are low. Uh, natural gas has brought prices way down. Uh, solar is more cost competitive than ever and, and wind prices are coming down too. So when we're talking about new generation and even retrofitting, uh, there's a serious you know, cost curve that, that folks are going to need to look at and, and understand. The opportunity with hydro isn't just on the, the profit end of it, there's a huge opportunity on cost savings for some industries that are energy intensive already. Uh, and I'll use an example that I'm, that I'm quite familiar with, which is the drinking water and wastewater utility sector. So these are public utilities or, or private utilities. Um, overall, the water sector, drinking water and wastewater, uses about 3% of our nation's energy. That doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but when you look at what their costs are, 80% of their cost comes from moving water around, pumping, uh, pumping water and moving it around. So if they can generate their own electricity, they can reduce their own costs and use that money for something else. I sort of doubt that it's going to trickle uh, you know, down to, to reduce water rates, and I don't know that that's you know, actually necessary. But if it provides them with the, financi the, with the finance, uh, where they can use money that they've saved from investing in hydropower in a water industry and use that to rehabilitate their uh, you know, deteriorating pipes and treatment plants so we can avoid situations like we saw in Flint, Michigan and other cases that are well understood in this country, I think that that would be a big benefit. Uh, and so we need to look in places where, uh, I think that's the beauty of hydropower, is that it's not just about uh, generation for increasing overall uh, capacity on the grid, it can also be looking within industries, within businesses, within utilities to see how we can reduce costs uh, and just be more efficient overall. Um, my last question, both Justin and Charles, you referenced the opportunity in rural America. Uh, and in my district, I represent a third geographically of New York State. Um, it's, it's one large, it is the largest district on the East Coast. And uh, there was a chart that was published this weekend, broken down by county, uh, that highlighted the lack of economic opportunity in parts of rural America when compared to suburban and urban parts of the country. What, um, do you have metrics or uh, potential stats on what an investment in hydro can look like for rural America that has been left behind in so many, uh, in so many ways, by, by so many ways that we measure uh, economic opportunity? You know, one way I could ask the question is what percentage of your projects are in rural communities versus urban suburban? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Anything uh, more specific? Other than Minneapolis and St. Paul, uh, which we've touched on. <laughs> we've not touched on Minneapolis. Uh, <laughs> we've discussed that. Um, no, so uh, anecdotally, uh, I think. 
think I don't have hard numbers uh, in front of me, but uh, I'm just I'm flashing through all the sites that I'm responsible for. Uh, we've got a couple in Lewiston, Auburn, Maine, which uh, you know it's not huge, but and some in the Bangor area. But the majority of our assets are are an hour's travel from those large cities. Our wind farm is in Berlin, New Hampshire. You're not going to find much around there. So. Uh, quite a bit of our hydro is in is in the rural areas and not around built up uh, suburban areas. Um, perhaps we can follow up with some more specific uh, metrics from your business, Adam. As you are working on new projects, um, what percentage are in rural um, regions versus suburban and urban? Um, I don't have hard numbers, and we don't have specific projects that we work on, but we have paired with some technology developers, I would say. Um, there, some of them are looking um, in some more rural areas where you have non-power dams, t tends to be the opportunity. Um, and a lot of those assets, uh, they're, they're aging, they're old, there's opportunity to add hydropower on them. Um, but there's not, not a lot is known about that. Not a, not a, some of the structures, they don't even know who owns the dam, so you have to go through this process of identifying who's the dam owner, who's responsible, who's the stakeholder. Um, but I think that an opportunity exists to identify where are the, those opportunities in rural areas for this immediate um, kind of hydropower opportunity at the non-power dams. So there are over 80,000 dams in the country, um, only roughly 2,400 of them have hydropower on them. So this could be an opportunity to look at, you know, where are the rural dams um, and where's that energy opportunity. And Charles, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I don't have any specific numbers, and but I, you know, I can contact a few folks that I know, and we'll be happy to follow up with your office, you know, on that. Um, but I think that, that the anecdotal evidence is, is strong, and I think that the, the case for millennials that we hear over and over in the news is that the education, folks are under a lot of pressure to keep getting more education and the opportunity just isn't materializing. I think that what's important, uh, it's important to use the hydro sector uh, as an example of an industry where at every point in the education system there's an exit ramp, and there's an exit ramp that can lead you to a hydro job. Uh, folks that are coming straight out of, out of high school can find jobs in construction. Folks with a two-year degree can find uh, skilled technical degrees. And this is what we need in rural America. Uh, because not all of the jobs are in big cities, and, and I've got a lot of friends uh, who don't want to finish degrees or didn't want to finish degrees and are now laden with debt that they're struggling to repay because uh, the, the jobs that they were able to find didn't match with the debt load that they needed to carry. So I think that it's part of what we need to do is, is change the dialogue and reopen the eyes of, of America uh, to what are the, the wide range of, of jobs that are available there. And that's where with a, a two-year degree uh, that, that focuses and emphasizes uh, biology might be a good degree to have to be able to help with one of the studies and reduce some of the costs that, that we're talking about that really drive hydropowers and other projects uh, to be very expensive to meet the permitting requirements. So I think that that's a, a key takeaway about this sector is that it should be used as an example uh, of something that, that has an opportunity for everyone along that education cycle. Well, that, that's a great place to wrap this up. Um, the purpose of the Millennial Task Force is to educate other members of Congress on uh, issues and opportunities facing the millennial generation. So while you know, many of my colleagues are coming back from their districts at this time, I'm pleased that we have some staffers from other congressional offices. And the fact that this is an, an official hearing to highlight this issue, that's part of this purpose today. And um, most of you noted that part of the challenges Hydro faces is, is an awareness challenge. Um, hopefully this is one small step in coming up with policy solutions uh, to help bridge that gap. I think the themes that we touched on in terms of workforce development, how you develop that pipeline at each step, whether it's graduating from high school, graduating with a vocational or technical program, uh, graduating as an undergrad or in graduate school, that there are opportunities out there in hydro. And those opportunities are only going to grow as the, the 45 to 56 year old hydro employees uh, end up retiring. Uh, you highlighted regulatory uh, modernization ideas in terms of addressing the FERC uh, process, uh, which uh, I think is, is in need of updating so that it reflects um, 
the opportunity within Hydro. So thank you to the three of you for such thoughtful responses for uh, making the trip to Capitol Hill uh, to advocate uh, on this important issue. And I look forward to working with you um, and, and continuing forward to try to work with other congressional offices on expanding our opportunities when it comes to Hydro. And this committee meeting is adjourned. Thank you.